salutations all. This is for intro to communications, and this is over the lesson of adapting to others' diversity in communication, otherwise known as chapter six in our course. All right, I am going to give, this is a quick Cliff Notes version of the textbook. I've never created one before because it's very hard for me to find the words that I want to use correctly or to say. So I'm just giving an abridged version of just, just so there's something extra to go with the PowerPoint presentations and Word document lesson reviews that are from the publishing company themselves of the textbook. I want to preference this again with I'm just using stuff from the book. I want to put that out there. now. I'm going to start this off with a quote from C.S. Lewis. There are no ordinary people. What a great quote. Now, I'm going to add my own thing into this. One of the things that makes this world beautiful is that we are all so uniquely different. No two persons are alike. Hold on, let me grab my textbook over here because it's got all my lessons highlighted and ready to go. There are no two persons alike. And I say that because even in a family dynamic, no two persons are alike. We are all uniquely different and that is beautiful and amazing and chaotic. But there it is. I say that also because like I have tw identical twin daughters. They are nothing alike. They both obviously, you know, came into the world a minute apart and have shared this world together, but they are uniquely different. And it's based off of their personal experiences and how they perceive the world and backgrounds. So the book, now I'm gonna go into book stuff. So here we go, bear with me. We are all different because we have different backgrounds and experiences. Now, we may be a part of groups or affiliations or subgroups because of a commonality of interest or socioeconomic class, ethnicity, culture, culture, um, orientation, self-identity. But we're still uniquely different, even though we may share commonality with affiliations and all other goodies. All right, so let's continue on with the book. The book talks about introducing adapting to others as the last principle. Now we, up to this point, we have talked about self-communication, self-identification, the ability to communicate with others. And we did the whole communication process basis information. Then we discussed nonverbal communication, verbal communication. We also discussed um, listening and responding. So adapting to others is kind of that last principle because at the beginning of each chapter, and I'm pretty sure they're in your PowerPoint presentations, there's like a little pentagram diagram that has the five, like they look like trivial pursuit wedges is the only way I best I can describe it. But it's also that aware verbal, nonverbal, listening, responding, and adapt. We've discussed the aware, that's the self-communication. We've discussed the verbal, that's everything that leaves your mouth or is written. Nonverbal is everything that's not written. I mean, everything that is not out your mouth or written or typed. Listening and responding, we just did that. The differences between hearing and listening, there's a difference, if you remember. And then so finally now we're wrapping it up with the adapting. The ability to adapt suggests that we have already have a sense of who we are and know we are conscious of the presence of others. So in just the process of learning to adapt to others, we are aware of who we are and what we want to communicate. So again, that's why they bring it out as the last portion of the principles. The underlining goals of this chapter, the overall theme is that it's to identify human differences that may inhibit communication with others and suggest adaptive strategies. So just like verbal, nonverbal, self-communication, listening and responding, there are barriers, and they discuss them in this chap 
chapter and then it also discusses ways that we can overcome barriers how we can move ourselves forward in the adapting process there are so many different categories represented in let me get my i've got notes all over the place there are so many categories in human diversity i'm going to name just a few but there are so many more that i'm not going to name and the book doesn't even go over all of them as well so the book goes over like five i do believe and i'm not going to like go into great detail on what the book goes over because again you have word document lesson reviews and powerpoint presentations from the publisher of the book so some of these categories involve social class age self-identification uh, race ethnicity uh, your political standings your religious affiliations uh your sexual orientation professional or uh, professional orient professional standing uh organizational uh, regional I say regional because, you know, I am in Eastern Kentucky. I don't, the majority of you may also be in Eastern Kentucky, but we, regional, it's the Appalachia. And you think in Louisiana, and then there's Creole, and then there's Southern, and there's Deep Southern, and then there's North, Northeast, Northwest, Midwest, that's all regional world, you know. Texas identifies themselves as their own area you know that's what i'm talking about when it comes to regional um back to the different categories there's also socioeconomic culture culture personality um disability again that is just a small snippet of category subcategories that represent the range of human diversity the book doesn't even go over all of them they go over it, like I said, into detail over a few. I'm going to kind of touch base on it. Not going to go into great detail, but there, it gives you an idea. So, along with this, the book discusses that the goal of being able to appropriately adapt your communication to others, it does not mean you have to abandon your traditions or preferences, orientations, and cultural elements that make you unique. And it also doesn't mean that you have to tell people what you want you want them to hear. It's just suggesting appropriately using communication strategies and adapting our communication to create open dialogue and non-discriminatory dialogue. And with that being said, all these groups all the groups that I said and the many, many more that I did not even cover all face discrimination. And the book's definition for discrimination, so I'm going back and forth, is the unfair or inappropriate treatment of categories of people based on race, sex, age, gender, ethnicity, as well as other group memberships. So all these groups that we talked about that I said and all the groups not mentioned and the subgroups not mentioned, and all the, all the above and in between not mentioned, face discrimination. Now, depending where you are culturally, or in this world, in the world, like world, or regionally, or locally, some groups may face discri more discrimination than others. And some groups may have unconscious discrimination or subconscious discrimination that is not maybe vocalized as loud, but is there. So, again, the underlining theme of this chapter is adapting to others. It is pretty much summarizing it to be... conscious of our communication and to be conscious is to be aware to be aware that there are differences seen and unseen you, know, you may visibly see there are differences but it's being conscious 
it's being conscious and being aware that we of the differences and adapting our communication that way so let's let's move into some of these diversity groups that the book talks um, one of the areas is I said age generational gaps the generations of origin is important implications for communication because this, this is how we relate to others in both family and work situations and each generation has developed its own set of values anchored in social economic and cultural factors and it also stems into our technology so they gave about four different in the book of generations and it's baby boomers generation x millennials and generation z i'm going to elaborate on that list a little bit so before the boomers you have what was called the silent generation and that was from 1925 to 1945 but it started off with the greatest generation and that's from 1901 to 1924. baby boomers are generally 1943 to about 1960. so you'll see there's an overlap in years where one generation like I said it was to 1945 and then baby boomers were 1943 so there's a few years overlap between generations um, then there's generation x generation x is from 1961 to 1981 millennials are from 82 to 96 generation z generally runs about 97 to 2012 then the newest generation that has been labeled is called Generation Alpha, and that's from 2013 to 2025. Now, I also want to preference this, is that there are some other generations that they call it Generation C. In Millennials, they have what they call the Elder Millennials, and those are the ones that were in the early years. But there's also Generation the generation X well they call it generation Zennial and it runs those like late 70s to early 80s and kind of around the same time as elder Millennials is the early 80s with that being said though they lump those into the folks that were we weren't, they weren't raised on technology, but they were there when the internet came into play. They, the Oregon Trail in the classrooms moved from, you know, landline to cell phone usage, you know, that, that generation. So I wanted to break this down a little bit more. And if you think of communication within the different generations, my kids are generation alpha. So they are more technology savvy. They are, they easily adapt to it much easier. Whereas I grew up in the 80s and the 90s when by the time I got to high school, you know, computer labs and all that was in full force and you had a regular class. But when I were in my younger years, you know, a classroom may have one computer that you got to play a game on and stuff. And the Oregon Trail <laughs> but like my parents generation my parents are both boomers so their way of communication they're not as tech savvy so if you think of it in text messaging they can send me a text message and it could be several paragraphs I can respond in several words whereas my children can respond in several letters that represent several words or phrases but that kind of just gives you an idea and then older generations their communication style you know more of the written word and then moved into more of telephones and like used to the cost of on the phone you know long distance phone call and the same way with cell phones you know cell phones now are just so easy to send and communicate with either talk or send text messages or instant messages or memes or emojis whatever the case may be here use when cell phones started picking up in popularity when they first they first came out in the 80s, but it was like the late 90s and 2000s when people started more readily getting cell phones. And it would cost, you had a free time if you call between certain hours, 
the phone calls were free, but before that, it cost you money for every phone call and for every minute that you talked, and for every text you sent, it cost you extra money, so that tells you the evolution. Let's keep going. Different, um, and then, so you kind of have to adapt how you talk. The point of that was that you obviously, if you're in a family dynamic, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your siblings, you know, my older brother is in the generation that, you know, you adjust how you communicate with someone your own age, with someone who's younger, with someone who's older. Pretty straightforward, I know. Um, the book, all that, it goes into more detail as well. Um, I'm going to talk about sex and gender. I'm not going to go into all the details that the books about the different descriptions of sexual identification or sexual orientation. The terminology that the book uses and the details are in the PowerPoint and the lesson review. I'm going to talk about it in the sense of there's the old, there was a book that was written. When was this written? It's a self-help book and it was men are from Mars and women are from Venus and basically put out we have two very different communication styles. Scholars built on that idea that there is a masculine communication style and a feminine communication style. So what do I mean by that? It means that a masculine style often communicates, it's communicating to report. Whereas a feminine style is a communication to establish rapport. So basically what the scholars have broke down based off of this book, and this book was written decades, decades ago, is that masculine style is just A, B, C, D. Boom, bang, nothing else. Where they say feminine style of communication is you're creating that, that open-ended I don't want to say open-ended, but you're creating a transactional communication style of the report, you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? You wait to hear back. Oh, that's wonderful. Let's elaborate. It's the, it's the tit for tat, this and that. Now, just because of your, what you identify as, female or male, it does not necessarily mean you have that communication style. I want to preference that and I want to elaborate that, you know. I am not here, nor does the book say that just because you are male or identify as male, that you have to just, you just talk to report. That's not true. That's not what is being said here. The same with female. We all have our communication styles, and some people are just matter of fact talkers. They're just like, this is to the point, here it is, no ifs, ands, or buts. Some people really like the art of talking. Sometimes I'm in the mood and I want to talk. I want to create a transactional. I want it back and forth. And there's sometimes I don't have the energy in me to create a dialogue. I just want to put the information there and I want to just go about my day. I just want things to end where they do. But then sometimes I don't feel like I'm being heard. So then I want the open dialogue even though I don't want open dialogue. It's very confusing. Again, I am just giving you the information in the book. Um... I was loading there for a second. Did you see that? I was just, <laughs> whew, lost my train of thought. So, so far we talked about age and we've talked about sex and gender. Again, overlining theme of this is adapting to others and that's being aware. So, when it comes to sex and gender and the awareness of our communication, it could just be, a, I don't want to say it's simple. That's not at all what I'm saying here. It could be the process or the act of acknowledging chosen names or pronouns or that some people don't want that label you know some prefer some choose and prefer the pronouns of he him she her they them some people just don't want the label they don't they don't want it so it's just with adapting it's acknowledging preferred names or preferred pronouns or it's, just, it's the awareness of the adapting message here again the overall theme of this chapter is adapting to others and how 
communication is diverse, but so is life and so is the world locally, regionally, culturally, worldly. And again, it's, it's all just, we all are uniquely beautiful because of our past experiences and backgrounds and our ourselves evolving you know we're not the same as what we were when we were 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 45 50, 50. I can keep going and I ramble a lot as you can see this is probably why I haven't done this chapter so if we move forward in our adapting world is race and ethnicity some scholars and some folks interchange the two and um, you know, it's not clear cut. Many, many, many decades ago, race was clear cut because it was based off of, um, where's the word I was looking for? Phenotypes. And phenotypes is, it's based off of your skin color. It's based off of your hair texture. It's based off of, it's physical attributes. So it's body type, hair color, texture, skin color this was many many decades ago so now scholars have evolved it it's it's more than just your physical attributes it's also the it is included with your cultural economic social geographic and historical elements all that comes into play so that's where an ethnicity comes into it's not just your you know, like I said, many, 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 many decades ago, race was just considered the physical attributes. I mean, it wasn't just considered physical attributes, but that's what it was, you know, questionnaires was based off of physical attributes. And that's how the evolution of race and ethnicity is coming because it encompasses so much more, so much more because just because you know there's there's so much out there that we don't physically see in a person and that's every person you you have visual but you know that's not that's not the whole picture that's not everything involved so they go into more details and that's the definition of discrimination comes in here and that's when I said that all groups are they are room for discrimination not room there's not room i like to say that we will get rid of all discrimination but in a perfect world every group faces discrimination but i said some groups face it more than others some it's a subconscious discrimination it may not be someone may not be shouting from the rooftops but it's there um one of the goals with being with adapting to others and seeing the differences or not even seeing acknowledging and being aware of the differences is that by learning about diversity and becoming aware of all of our differences and similarities among groups and subgroups and all the above and in between is to eliminate discrimination and stereotypes that cause people to to rigidly and inappropriately prejudge others. Stereotypes is one of the barriers that is discussed in this book, and that is a strong one. And there are stereotypes based off of how we look, how we act, what groups we're in, what groups we're affiliated with, what organizations we are affiliated in, or our backgrounds, our religion, you name it, and there are stereotypes for it. Anyway, before I go off on that tangent, but again, with race and ethnicity, and it's the same with the previous two, it's being aware. It's being consciously aware of differences, you know, and choice of communication and words and addresses. The book then also talks about social, social class. And this is the last one that the book really talks about. But like I said, there's so many more other groups and subgroups that aren't even really discussed in this book but are obviously prevalent 
throughout, you know, there's just so many, you, there are complete textbooks and journals and books on this alone. But the last one that the book really touches base on is social class. And social class refers to the status, influence, and power people are perceived to have based on their way of life, family, job, money, and education. So, we see that, thinking of as lower class, middle class, blue collar, white collar, um, upper class, the 1%, that's social class. That all falls, that all goes into it. And within that, there's socialization, and this is social class influences who we talk to and even who we talk about, and how who we may invite to social gatherings and who we choose as our friends and partners. The book discusses social class as ways that we communicate it, or it can be communicated, is who we interact with, how we interact with people, what we wear, uh, schools attended, or visible status symbols. I hate that. I say that because if you think of school age kids and you like to think it's not as prevalent now, but kids are picked on because of what they wear or what they're not wearing or whose shoes they're wearing or whose handbag they're carrying or what brand of clothes that they wear. And it's, it's sad. And I'm not going to continue on any more in that example, but I just wanted to give an example with that. But again, I'm not going into great detail. So the book went over social class, race, ethnicity, age, sex, and gender. I said five, but there was four. That's what the book goes over, and they go into more detail. Now, other groups that aren't discussed that take into account that a face diversity or or just because of but other groups subgroups traits are your religious affiliation your spiritual affiliation your political affiliation um self-identification at, um, disability, social, economic, cultural, professional, regional, organizational, all that, and so much more. Again, so much that I did not say or is in between or above and below. There's so many cultures and groups that fall into this range that, that are that is human diversity. Now, all of these factors, all of these, these groups are what we call intersectionality. Intersectionality is just a combination of all of these differences to make us us, to make us each our uniquely beautiful person. So this is what contributes to our individual responses to the social world world and it's based off of who we are as a person and all of these factors and our backgrounds and our experiences and our ever evolving sense of self. Whew! That was fun. So it kind of goes into more of um, cultural aspects now of, um, of cultural communication and it just kind of talks about culture itself and cultural culture the textbook's definition is a learned system of knowledge behavior attitudes beliefs values and norms that is shared by a group of people that are shaped from one generation for the next what does that mean culture cultures are not static they are ever changing with new information and new technology to help mold them not mold them but to give them more information so for that reason they're not static they're ever growing um, and then it kind of goes into intercultural communication and this is just communication between different cultures. So think of it in the sense of 
And it could be one-on-one -on -one or it could be groups. And it's not just the, you know, the obvious communication, which is the verbal. There could be language barriers. But there's also custom barriers. What is deemed okay or jovial or fun hand expressions in our world, like a wave or a peace symbol or something, could be offensive to another culture. Culture, And again, it's not adapting. It's, it's being consciously aware. If you're going to go travel to another country, maybe becoming aware of their, their customs. Here, we may shake men or women's hands, but other cultures, you don't shake a woman's hand. It's a, a being aware. It's being mindful. It's being aware, and it's a, it's conscious. There we go. They also talk about like um, context cultures. There's high and low, and high context cultures are more. They they take or derive their information more on the nonverbal than they do the verbal whereas low context culture relies more or takes more from the verbal than the nonverbal um they kind of give a little this little image uh, it's i'm pretty sure it's on your powerpoint too of different high cultural culture and low culture context countries um high culture is like age it says asian arab southern southern european african and south american Whereas low culture, and this is um, emphasis on words, high culture's emphasis on the nonverbal, is other Northern European countries, Australian, American, Scandinavian, German, and Swiss. So that, okay, I could see that. But again, just like every other culture, every other group, subgroup, affiliation, orientation, personal identity, Self-identity, self-identification, it's being aware. It's being conscious, being mindful, and being aware. So, with that, the context is you find cultural values. What they prefer, what they don't. Um, are they a col 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 collectivistic or individual individualistic culture? What do I mean by that? Um, collectivist collectivistic culture are groups that place high value on teamwork and group work, whereas individualistic, kind of more so the individual. And that's pretty straightforward. Uh, then we kind of just talk about, we talked about feminine and masculine communication. They have feminine and masculine commun uh, culture, cultures as well. I'm not really gonna go into that. Um, different barriers and we already kind of talked about stereotyping and stereotyping is dangerous it stereotyping and prejudice are strong and they are big ones um stereotype is to place a person or a group of persons into an inflexible all-encompassing category so it would be like saying well all men are by you know all men like the gym well, only women like to be in the kitchen or all bodybuilders are, you know, jocks or all jocks are me or all this group is flighty, you know, that's a stereotype. And that's not true at all. Absolutely not. There are so many stars. Okay. Dolph Lundgren. He's an action star. He's a bodybuilder. He's martial. He's all these things. And he was in the original He-Man series. He was in Rocky films. He, you know, he's a certified genius. The, oh my gosh, is it the guitar player or bass player from Queen? He's an astrophysicist. I hope I got that right. Very, very smart man. So, the old adage, don't judge a book by its cover. Oh gosh, hello. So if adapting to others, diversity and communication, if the theme is being mindful, conscious, and being aware of others and their differences, let's, let's not judge a book by its cover. I'm gonna wrap that chapter up with don't judge a book by its cover. Anyway, other barriers are assuming differences and assuming similarities. 
So I know they kind of contradict each other, but sometimes when we're seeking information or introducing ourselves to new people, we'll find similarities and we'll base our entire communication off that, even though it may not, you, we may think we have a lot in common with someone because we watch the same film or we read the same books, but that could be the only thing that's similar, you know? Hey, oh my gosh, you read, I've read all of the Interview of the Vampires. Oh, that is a lie. I haven't read the last few books, but I read The Vampire Chronicles. That would be like me talking to someone and reading The Vampire Chronicles, thinking they like all the movies that I like and all the books that I read, and I read a lot of books. And thinking, oh, well, if they like that, then they must like this book because it's also about vampires. But in case they may not even like vampire books, they just like Anne Rice or they like that particular book. That's what I'm talking about here. And assuming differences is thinking, well, aren't we all alike? Okay, we may have similar likes, as in every culture deals with death, but it's our beliefs in death. You know, some of cultures is that we bury, think of ancient Egyptians, they mummified. Um, other cultures mummified, and they did it differently. And some cultures revere, and they, you know, each culture has its own beliefs on death, even though we all, all cultures deal with it. Okay. And then, what was the other one? Um, assuming superiority. That's a big barrier. So, under superiority is um, ethnocentrism and xenophobia. So, ethnocentrism. I hope I'm not butchering these. I'm trying to get through this and wrap this up because this has been a long lecture. The belief is that one's own culture's traditions and assumptions are superior to those and other. Do I need to go into detail about that? This is where one person thinks that they are, or their group, is better than all others. That they hold themselves higher than anyone else. See how that's a barrier? I bet you do. And then xenophobia is the fear and dislike of someone from a different culture or country. See how that's a barrier too? All these are barriers. All of these inhibit communication with other, between individuals, between subgroups, between groups, between cultures. Keep it going. So, we're getting ready to wrap this up and just talk about ways that we can adapt, strategies to adapting with other. Is aim for intercultural communication competence. What does that mean? Be mindful of differences. Develop positive attitudes about adapting to others who are different from you. Strive to tolerate ambiguity and uncertain. You don't have to like everything that you hear or that you don't have to like everyone that you meet. But it's, but you don't have to be mean. You may, you will not like every person that you have ever met. You will not like every person in their subgroup or their or what they believe. You you will not like every single person that, you know, every aspect of that person. But this says just being mindful of their differences and developing positive attitudes and tolerate. And also to increase our knowledge of others, seeking information about a culture, asking questions and listening to the responses and developing developing a communication system. This is just becoming other oriented and learning appropriate ways to ethically adapt our communication. So underneath this, it talks about motivation and mindfulness and self-talk. So motivation is that we have the motivation to want to learn, you know, perhaps you meet someone and you want, you, you want to know. You want to do things or say things or create things that they enjoy. So, you you have the motivation there. And mindfulness is just being aware of what we're doing, what we're saying, and how we're putting it out there in the world. And self-talk is, you're kind of hyping yourself up. You're like, okay, I don't really know what's going on, but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to, I'm going to listen. I'm going to have my open ears and I'm really going to, like, you're just... Yeah, you're on your, you are your own hype person. Let's talk about developing positive attitudes, you know. If we go in there with negativity, it's going to, it's going to show, um, in its toleration. So, all of that in caps. So, again, to recap all that is developing motivation. So, it's develop, having mindfulness, positive attitudes, tolerate ambiguity, um, 
seeking information, asking questions, listening, really taking it in, becoming other oriented and ethically adapting to others. So again, I know I blurbed and I stumbled and I just maybe caused conf confusion. But if you take nothing else away from this lesson, just we are all uniquely different. And that's what makes everyone amazing. And it's just being aware that of all these different things that make us us. And it's based off our experiences, our backgrounds, and our affiliations and self-identification of who we are and who we want to be in this world. So it's becoming mindful, becoming aware, and becoming conscious of our communication with others. Locally, regionally, nationally, worldly. Anyway, folks, I hope I didn't ramble too much and that you have an amazing day. Thank you. Bye.